Hi, I'm Matthew Burt. Oh, come on, you know who I am. If you're watching this, you've been watching Behind the Wings all year long, and 2019 was amazing. And why? Because of people like you. Now, let's get right on to that beautiful bean footage. Okay. I told you guys that we were gonna have a super awesome guest and right here is an actual wild weasel F-105 pilot, Charlie Johnson, who just happens to be on our board of directors here at Wings Over the Rockies. So I get to see him all the time, which is pretty cool. Charlie, thank Matthew. you so much for being here, oh, man. This is you, awesome. So give us a little bit of your history with the Thud. You have not flown this thing like just once or twice. That is correct. I've got about 1,200 hours in it. Wow. Uh, Got about 600 in the D model, which is single seat, and right. 600 in the Weasel. Now, tell us how you got into the Weasels. That's kind of, of all the military aircraft lore, the Wild Weasels are probably right at the top. Everybody just goes nuts over the Weasels. Now, were you voluntold, or did you volunteer? No, I volunteered, absolutely. I think 90% of the Weasels volunteered. Best mission over there, the uh, rules of engagement, you kind of set yourself. Oh, no I kidding. Did, and I just, I'll get off on a side, so I'm sure you can edit this. Oh, that's the, no, we'll, we'll just run it, baby. One of the things that's interesting about the weasel is when you go to weasel school, the first two or three flights you have to fly to absolute perfection. Make every rule, every radio call, uh, pay attention to every single restriction. And then you take your check ride and, and you have to really do well in it. And once they do that, they sit you down in class the next day and they say, now we're going to teach you how to break all the rules. <laughs> so, and that may not be, be correct, but it fit because I think the weasels are still doing it. Oh, I bet you guys are. I've heard rumors. Right. So now who did you fly with in the weasels? What squadron? Uh, the 610th Wild Weasel Squadron, the 18th Tech Fighter Wing. And that was out was of? Karat Air Force Base Karat. in Thailand. Yeah. And so you, how long were you overseas? A year. Wow. That's, uh, it, they used to do the 100 mission tours and they stopped that in, uh, in the late 60s and it, it just became a one year tour. What year were you over? 71, 72. Okay, so how many missions a day would you guys routinely fly? A weasel generally is a very unique mission. We would brief, the clock started at midnight. Mm, so okay. it, uh, briefing generally took two hours. An average flight was four and a half to five hours and you'd land and debrief and then they'd start the clock then. It was usually about nine hours. So they'd start the clock and you'd have 12 hours off. So then you'd take the nine o'clock briefing the next night and it kept backed up and you did that for two and a half weeks and just constantly rotated through. Oof. There was a requirement to have two weasels airborne at that phase of the war at all times. And uh, so basically we had two weasels airborne, we were briefing, we had spares. But uh, it's pretty intense as far as the flying. Oh, I bet. I think I had, which uh, you know, some of your listeners that flew 105s may call them. <laughs> friends, but I think I had uh, a couple months for over 100 hours of combat time. Wow. So well, I can see it. You intense. guys were pretty valuable. Yeah. And the long, you know, and if you didn't have uh, the guys who were supposed to come up and replace you, then you'd stay on station until they could get a spare cranked up. So I, one of my missions was eight and a half hours. I had a lot that were close to six hours. So almost 99% of the people watching this video are gonna know what a wild weasel mission was. Right. But for those that don't, can you just kind of give us the overview of, of what the wild weasel was doing over in Vietnam? The wild weasel primarily was to suppress the surface air missiles. They started off in the F-100, but those were the highest attrition rates that we had with the uh, basic losses to SA-2s. So our job was to fly ahead of the strike force and behind the strike force and get the uh, SAMs to come up on us, the signals that look at us and get them to shoot at us so then we could go down and take the site out. So you were telling me earlier before we started filming about this time you launched a standard arm. <laughs> Can you go through that real quick? Yeah, the AGM-78 is a standard arm. It weighed about, uh, and again, the purists out there will know exactly, it weighed about 2,500 pounds, give or take a little bit. You carried it usually on the left wing and you'd launch it, it would drop off the wing, you'd roll inverted, it would light and then you'd follow it down, it would mark the target for you. 
and I dropped one off the wing one time and it blew up underneath me. <laughs> so I'm sitting there looking at it and it looked like somebody sandblasted the canopy and wow. the airplane uh, it didn't have any major damage at all. So now when you say you followed it down, you guys didn't just kind of do a standoff launch and then wait for it. I mean, you literally went down well, we on the deck. Down, yeah, yeah. so you could use the gun or whatever weapons you had with it on the site. It, it literally marked the site like a fact. <sighs> and you, so then you were, you were going after so standard R means um, standard anti-radiation anti yeah, anti missiles. missiles. So you were literally going after the Fansong radar vans Correct. and the fire cans that were controlling Correct. the guns and all that kind of stuff. And the idea being is that once those radar sites went down, then obviously the SA-2s couldn't launch. Yeah, the whole goal was to just get them off the air so they couldn't, basically they couldn't guide them. And then, and those guys were surrounded by all sorts of AAA. Oh yeah. Ground Ooh. fire, but little odds and ends. <laughs> <laughs> what was the scariest part about that? The scariest part, and, I, and again, it's interesting. You talk to any fighter pilot, they're going to give you a different impression. Was going out to the airplane and starting it and taking off. Really? Just starting the mission. Once you got into it, you got into the rhythm. You hit the tanker. Then everything became very routine and very normal. I, if you can call normal the war <laughs> yeah exactly but it was it really with me it was always just just getting in the machine no kidding yep. so once and you're up there it's just i mean it's business as usual that's yeah, what you do yep. that makes sense and that's why america's been kicking butt for yep. 200 well, and some are, odd years we have an incredible bunch of warriors at every 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 level oh you know, yeah Marines, no Army, kidding. Navy, super people dedicated well, Charlie, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you coming, and we appreciate your service, too. Well, I appreciate the honor, and, and it's a privilege for me to be here. You know, and you're our first board member to be on Behind the Wings. Outstanding. Yeah. That's, and now, how much do I have to pay you for letting me sit in the cockpit? <laughs> That's free, baby. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Have a really cool set of toys, but... Okay. All right, John, you have an amazing set of toys, but this... This Come is the on. real deal. Yeah, so what we have here is an Apollo A7L. It is the oh, basic man. suit to go to the moon in. When the Apollo mission started, the A7L was the suit to wear, right? So this, this particular suit belonged to uh, William Anders, who was the command module pilot for Apollo 8. Wow. It was not a flown suit. It was his flight spare. Each astronaut had three suits that were made for them. A flight suit, a flight spare, in case they had a problem with the first one, and a training suit. So this is Bill's flight spare. So basically a miniature spacecraft. Everything that the spacecraft did for the astronaut, the suit had to do. Wow. So this, I mean, this is the real deal. If, if the yeah. first suit got a, a rip in it when he was doing something, this was literally the backup. Correct, yeah. No kidding. So it, uh, you know, bolt for bolt and stitch for stitch, identical in how they were made. They were, they were form made for the astronaut. This, this suit was like a glove. So a complete glove for the body. It had to it had to protect that particular astronaut. You know, we all come in different sizes yeah. and shapes. So, uh, yes. Speaking of sizes, he's really short. Sure. So uh, the suit appears short this way. You have to remember it was full of air. It was pressurized at, at about five and a half pounds per square inch of pressure. So the suit would stand up with air in it. So that astronaut, when he put Duh. it on. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. So it was um, it was a requirement for the suit. And in, in, in later suits presented a challenge uh, when we started taking cars to the moon. Uh, in this particular suit, you could not sit down. There's, oh. there's no stitching in there to allow you. If you remember Apollo 11, when Neil and Buzz landed, they were standing. When you landed in a lunar module, you were not sitting in a chair. There was no chair in the lunar module. So you couldn't even bend all the way because it would wow. require things that would compromise the safety of the suit to the point where they, they decided to delete that. So this suit uh, was a, a marvel of, of engineering from, from the helmet down to the boots. Uh, if this astronaut in this suit were on the moon and the sun was shining on the front of this suit, it would be 240 degrees Fahrenheit, while at the same exact instant on that astronaut's back in the shade, 220 below zero. So almost a 500 degree temperature differential <laughs> on that astronaut. No air in the middle to make it lukewarm. So the challenges to going to space and what the Apollo program addressed so well and so elegantly was there is no place like Earth. Everywhere right. you go out there is an alien world in every way. So these suits had to bring the comforts of home, of Earth, with that astronaut to keep them alive. We're, we're a very fragile being. So how did, how did you cool 
the person inside the sure. suit. Sure, so multiple layers here. The, the, a spacesuit and a quick breakdown would be the outer layer, if you think a pair of Carhartt coveralls. Okay, it's to keep and that's all the, the white part. Right, the white part, and that's to keep all the important parts underneath from getting torn, ripped, bent, or broken. The blue, which you can just see through here, is the actual pressure suit. If you think a deep okay. sea diver, all right. you have a pressure suit that contains all the air and keeps that inside. Well, if you've ever had a wetsuit on as a, as a diver or a pilot as, with a flight suit on, you mm -hmm. get hot pretty quick. You can't have that in that environment of space. So really close to the skin, right next to the astronaut's skin, they wore another garment called a cooling garment, a liquid cooling garment. And it had a series of, if you think a pair of long underwear, long johns, right. and pipe through that a couple of miles of airline tubing that we remember as fish tank yeah. airline tubing as kids, had miles of that in this suit that uh, either hot or cold water could be pumped through to keep that astronaut comfortably cool or warm, whichever and the environment requires. All of that was self-contained in the backpack. In the backpack, sure. And all metered through uh, the controls that the astronauts had minimum control of. The only thing that um, was really custom made, body molded, was the astronauts' gloves. If you look at a pair of lunar EVA gloves mm -hmm. for all the, and to this day, even um, the modern suits we have, the only thing handmade for each particular astronaut today still is the gloves. The Apollo astronaut gloves, the pressure glove, the black glove, if you look, they even have the knuckle ridges molded into them because they took molds of those astronauts' hands because ultimately we went to the moon to do work. And these are our, yeah, these are our tools, true. right? These are our primary tools. So the astronaut had to bend this suit, wow. and this suit is basically a, a balloon in the shape of a human, and it's very <laughs> difficult to bend a volume of air. So, so the, the fingertips... Sure. What so, is that? So those are siliconized rubber. Uh, we have all these new wonderful kitchen tools now made of yeah. silicon for high temperature gloves. It's nothing new. The, the Apollo uh, folks that developed that program knew the surface would be warm and they knew that there would be some abrasion involved. So that's high temperature silicone that protected that very fine custom made pressure glove we just talked about with all the knuckles in it. You didn't want to tear that. So that was right next to your skin. It gave you the maximum amount of dexterity and you had the silicon to provide you a little bit of grip. So huh. you had to work that glove, and every astronaut that's walked the surface of the moon will tell you their, their hands were completely exhausted, and some chafed to the point of, of, of uh, raw fingertips. No kidding. Sure, just trying How to flex that suit. How many PSI were in this each So suit? about five and a half pounds per square inch. It doesn't sound like very much, but contained in a volume against multiple layers of fabric, it was quite the effort just to flex Just to bend. bend your arm and your fingers sure. and all that kind of stuff. So within this suit at each joint, your elbow joints and your knee joints, even your hip, there are a series of cables and bellows like baffles that allowed the suit to move and the cables restricted it from moving too far. If, if and like we talked about earlier, this suit would stand up if you put right. air in it. If you put too much air in it, it would stand up higher than the astronaut. So a lot of uh, aviation gear, high pressure suits right, or right. high altitude pressure suits that we wear in aircraft, have this mechanism that links the, the ring of the helmet to the suit. And that's to prevent your neck ring, from, in case of an inflation, from oh. exceeding the, the level of your chin <laughs> and, and possibly oh, wow. your vision. So this suit was, was a series of cables and bellows and, and different stitching to, to keep it in the shape of that person that was using it. Did any of these guys ever come back from the surface with actual Tears. holes? They did. There were, there were a, a, a series of compounded problems to the lunar surface, the soil, and, and perhaps you'll see some of that here while you're here at NASA Glenn. Um, the soil was very abrasive and very rough on the moon, and it got into things like the wrist cuffs. These cuffs oh, were man. made to pivot so that the astronaut could articulate their wrist, and that was metal on metal, and when you get fine-grained uh, grit in there, it actually wore the metal to the point, and the astronauts themselves would get little tears in their outer gloves. Fortunately, it was the outer gloves and Oof. not through to the pressure gloves. But there were minor leaks in joints on the wrist cuffs, and again, the low pressure, relatively low pressure in the suit kept that from being a major problem. But um, despite all of the effort to make this as safe as possible, they still had issues and mechanical uh, problems to overcome. It wow. remains a challenge. If we're going to go back to the moon and on to Mars, we're going to have to face those problems yeah. and revisit those with new technology. And there's things that exist now that didn't then. So on the helmet, yes, this does not look like the helmet that you see in all the photographs. Sure. Right. So uh, uh, um, a lot of people believe that that big, beautiful helmet with the gold visor yeah. was the actual pressure helmet for the moon. It wasn't. If you think of, uh, of a hard hat, uh, you have this pressure bubble that keeps this astronaut breathing nice, 
nice breathable air. Um, you don't want to take that out on the moon and take the chance of tripping and breaking it, you know, hitting a rock with it. <laughs> yeah. So if you had a hard hat, you could put over that, which is what they had. They, they called the Apollo helmet the LEVA, the Lunar Excursion Visor Assembly. And it was a hard hat that went over this and had a series of visors, that gold visor right. that would lift. So that was uh, okay. over the top of this bubble. So you still required this. I'm going to ask a question. Ask away. Can I try that on? Absolutely. Sure, we can make that happen. So I really shouldn't as a curator, but... Well, you who am the, I to say no when chance. you say yes? So you'll want to tilt it back and then back over your head just like that. Mm. There you are. I love it. They sound like <laughs> really cool in here. <laughs> that, Great that is right? not a lot of space. Would you want to spend eight hours in there? No. <laughs> so that's no, the question. No, not right? in the least. So there was a lot of... A lot of um, uh, getting a getting accustomed to it, getting used to things involved with, with so helmets. we were talking earlier sure. this pattern right here yeah is actually where the air came into the helmet so like so many other elegant parts of this spacesuit uh, one of the challenges you have in your car and your windshield is with your hot breath you get a foggy windshield right well you couldn't yeah, you can't stick like... your hand in there and wipe it clean. <laughs> so the designers of the helmet came up with the, the, first of all, the air comes into the helmet. There was a separate set of air. There was air to the astronaut's helmet and air to the astronaut's suit. Oh. Air in both, but there was a, a, a device you wore between the two called a neck dam that kept the air from interchanging. And that's this piece right here? That's, that's this rubber okay. piece underneath. So the oh, air for the helmet came up through the back and it just happens to line up with, there's a, there's a hole in the, okay. in, the, in the ring of the helmet here, and it lines up with a channel on this headrest. So they knew you had to have a headrest. Yeah. You want to bang your head in there. So to maximize the advantages of that, they built a channel into this headrest that comes up like a Venturi in an, air, in an aircraft um, pitot tube. You get the you get airflow in there that gives you some yeah. data. So it speeds up the airflow here and it ports it out at the bottom here and sends it racing around the helmet. So effectively, you have this nice little defroster going wow. all the time in your helmet. As a just as a side sheer effect to of air, thought that goes into yeah, everything, every little that, thing. Oh, yeah, it's just amazing. Uh, the, you could spare no no risk. Oh yeah. So you were there, and you were basically alone. You had an EVA partner, but there wasn't room for for unknowns. So one of the the brilliant things that came out of the Apollo program was how many problems were solved, and how much technology that didn't exist before it happened was created for the program and then has since translated into our everyday environment. There's NASA and everything we do. We're here with Lieutenant Colonel Ken Overturf. Like I said before, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much. This is awesome to have you here. Glad to be here, Matt. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did when you were in Vietnam flying Hueys? Um, my first job of flying uh, I flew a special intelligence mission, a radio direction finding, uh, obviously to locate the enemy. And then subsequently I uh, changed to flying scout aircraft, which were small, maneuverable. A little loach. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the loach. If, uh, if uh, you've ever seen the old Magnum series, it was the helicopter that they used in the old Magnum oh, very series. cool. I bet that thing was a little rocket. It was uh, like flying a sports car compared <laughs> to a Huey. Yeah. So when you were flying Hueys and you were doing direction finding, that was Operation Left Bank. That's right, Project Left Bank. Project Left Bank. So can you give us a quick rundown of what that actually was and why? Um, in, in, in the Vietnam environment, it was very difficult to, uh, to locate the enemy, jungles, mountains, very difficult to locate the enemy. And uh, what we determined is one uh, a positive way uh, to locate the enemy is when they communicated with each other and uh, radio communications. Uh, so the, uh, the radio direction finding capability was developed uh, and in initially used on the ground and in fixed wing aircraft. Uh, but the lo identification of locations was not as specific as we were able to do in a rotary wing aircraft. So we, uh, the, the project left bank evolved into a, a radio direction finding capability that could uh, provide very precise locations on radio transmitters. And where there's a radio transmitter, 
there's a there's a command group. Behind there's it, yeah. a command group of some okay. kind, and um, so we we evolved that capability into uh, from a strategic capability into a tactical capability. I.e., identify the target and attack the target immediately, as opposed to three or four days later under a strategic theme. So left bank, you guys were flying D model Hueys. No, H models. H they were, models. They were the first H models. Yes. Okay, and it's a little bit bigger than this guy. Bigger than this guy. And so it was you, co-pilot, and then a couple of guys in back. And and two uh, uh, code operators or intercept operators sitting in a bank of equipment right behind the, the pilot seats. And so what you were trying to do, basically, like you were saying, is is pinpoint the location of a radio signal. And so you were telling me earlier, you had a, an instrument off to the right of the stick where, was it just a, a was it a needle? It was a needle uh, with, uh, uh, on a 180 80 degree uh, set. And uh, so uh, at the head of the needle was zero degrees, and then it was 10, 15, 20 graduated down off each side. Okay. And so what you would do is fly to a known location, hover over that location as much as you could at, say, what, 2,500 feet? Correct. And then line up that needle so that it's, it's zero? When that needle is at zero, I see what my heading is. Okay. That's, that's the direction to that transmitting radio. Okay. And then you would try to get three or four readings so that you can definitely pinpoint exactly where those guys are. For, uh, for any sort of an accurate reading, you had to have at least three shots. Okay. And we can see by inter uh, intersection of those shots where they cross. Obviously, the more shots you have, the finer the uh, uh, identification of the location. And then once you've got a, a, a good location, could you call in what they called a pink team after that and then immediately take it out? Or did you have to go to higher command and say, hey, we've got people there, we need an artillery strike or uh, an airstrike? Uh, no, based on, based on our experiences as we were evolving, when we in the left bank bird would actually go down and, and, and look at the target area that we had identified, uh, once we had had uh, developed that and verified our, the accuracy of our work, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the, the, um, the commanders were more than happy to take that mission away from us because losing a left, bird bird, left bank bird was a very uh, 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 expensive proposition. So uh, once we had proved the, uh, the effectiveness of our tactics, uh, then the, um, uh, the division commander, uh, Major General George Casey, uh, assigned on-call pink teams to left bank. When I identified a target, I would call, and if they weren't already in the air behind me, they would immediately launch and, and meet me over the location area. And a pink team composed of? Uh, one loach, one small bird, mm -hmm. and one gunship. Uh, either uh, um, uh, a uh, mic model, and then by the time uh, uh, we were at that point in the war, we had the Cobras. Ooh. So it was a uh, it was a loach and a Cobra on the hybrid. That's some that's some destruction right there. Now speaking of losing a left bank bird, you actually got shot down in one of your missions as flying left bank. I, I I did. We um, uh, and that's what uh, was the beginning of the end to our identifying our own targets. <laughs> um, we um, we were we were hovering low, uh, spreading the bamboo with our rotor wash so we could see the ground, and um, uh, we heard an explosion and uh, took. A number of hits through the tail boom. Uh, we we got over. We were able to get over 
to a clear space to, to set down and um, uh, it appeared that the enemy had put a claymore mine up in a tree and blew the claymore mine and all the pellets went through the tailbone. No kidding. Yes. That's, that's really sneaky. That, that, that kind of tells me that they expected you to be in that area because you can't really climb up into a tree, put a claymore up there and then run back down and hit the clacker. The left bank bird was very identifiable because it had a large square antenna oh. hanging right off of the nose. So uh, by, by that time, uh, the, the, I'm sure that the left bank was birds well known. Were, were, were well known, yes. That's wild.